Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Grzma Abousseh, the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies and the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And along with the International Policy Center at the Ford School, um, we are delighted to welcome Ambassador Christopher Hill um, to the University of Michigan and to Ann Arbor. Ambassador Hill is currently the dean of the Josef Korbel School at, of International Studies at the University of Denver. He's an incredibly experienced and accomplished diplomat, having served as the American ambassador to Macedonia, Poland, South Korea, and Iraq, which is an incredible panoply of assignments. And in a career that has spanned over three decades in the Foreign Service, Ambassador Hill has also been a trenchant player in some of, those, some of the biggest conflicts worldwide, such as the fallout from the wars of Yugoslav succession and the Dayton Peace Accords, the six-party talks with North Korea designed to resolve the concerns with the North Korean nuclear weapons program, and the formation of a new government in Iraq. And frankly, given this aff affinity for difficult, if not heartbreaking, challenges, it is perhaps not surprising that he's also a Red Sox fan. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, Milosevic Martinez, it kind of falls off the tongue. Um, and tonight, Ambassador Hill will speak on the central issues facing American policy today in a speech entitled Managing 21st Century, a 21st Century Agenda, U.S. Foreign Policy Beyond Iraq and Afghanistan. So please join me in wel welcoming Ambassador Christopher Hill. Well, thank you very much, Anna, and thank you for that gratuitous comment about the Red Sox. Uh, but, you know, isn't this like Detroit Lions territory here? So, uh, you know, I, uh, I think, you know, these teams are there to often to try our souls. And, uh, you know, you just have to learn from it and be a better person as a result of it. So uh, the fact that we're up against a team that has one-eighth of our payroll that can't even uh, half fill its stadium in Tampa Bay is pretty hard to take. But uh, anyway, it is great to be here at the University of Michigan, a uh, school that has just extraordinary success across the, uh, the spectrum. I, I know many people know about your uh, sports teams, but many more people know about uh, your simply fabulous uh, uh, education that you provide here. The, uh, the graduate schools are, you know, invariably you're, you know, you're listed in the top ten in our country. You've produced some of the greatest leaders of our country, and uh, I can just tell you what a, what a great honor it is to uh, to be here and have this opportunity to talk with you. It's also wonderful to be here with Ambassador and Mrs. Uh, uh, Weiser, who uh, Ambassador Weiser and I uh, were together in, um, I guess we call it Central Europe. Uh, uh, Poland and Slovakia, and we had a, a group of us who were in this uh, Central European area, uh, Slovakia, uh, uh, Czech Republic, I think we added uh, Romania, uh, and let me see, Poland, Hungary, and uh, we used to get together every uh, few months and uh, sort of exchange thoughts on what was going on. And uh, Ambassador Weiser was very much focused on a country that, uh, on a country that hadn't always had success, uh, Slovakia, and there are many doubters, you know, when the Czechoslovak uh, divorce took place, there was an exp uh, expectation that somehow the Czech Republic would do very well, Slovakia would somehow, you know, slip into uh, Central Asia or something. But in fact, in the fullness of time, Slovakia, I think, did very well, got its economy together, went through the difficult phase that many of these countries have gone through, where you know, first you have democracy, then you have uh, sort of a pushback from uh, the former communist uh, regimes, and then you have uh, sometime, sometimes kind of virulent nationalists uh, come in. And yet uh, Slovakia went through all of these uh, phases and emerged, I think, as a very strong economy. Uh, it's manufacturing center, uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, frankly, when you look at all the countries in the region, I think it was really one of the strongest. And Ron, I know you worked very hard to kind of keep people on task there. And I think you're really in a great tradition of American diplomats who've sort of worked with a country, not stand back and lecture the country, but rather stand up close and work very, uh, work very well with it. And I know you're very fondly remembered in, in Slovakia. Um, I'd like to just mention uh, 
Another person here that I served with, uh, actually Les and Judy High are sitting over here. Les High was, uh, was in Krakow when I was in, um, in Warsaw. And so I, I haven't seen Les since we were together in Poland. So it was great to see you here in Ann Arbor and see Les and uh, Judy here. Um, I can't think of a better place to move to except maybe Denver. Um, <laughs> Our football team in Denver isn't much better than the Lions either. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, 21st century um, uh, agenda in our foreign policy because I think uh, we have gone through a very tough period in our, in our history. And I think it kind of behooves us maybe to learn from some of the mistakes and uh, try against all hope not to repeat those mistakes. I think, um, let me just begin by saying that for anyone watching the American political scene these days, I think it's fairly uh, clear that our country is living through a very kind of ideological time. Uh, and without getting too political myself, I mean, we see uh, our two political parties in the, in the Congress taking kind of very, uh, you know, positions where I think it has been very difficult to uh, bring to bear a kind of center uh, position. I mean, the view that somehow all problems can be solved by uh, uh, tax cuts versus the view that all problems can be solved by government programs really, I think, lends itself to kind of an ideological perspective. And I think ideology has an important role to play. I mean, after all, we also live in a time where we're subjected to billions of factoids every day, and you need some sort of navigation system to get through those, uh, those factoids. But I think when we see ideolo ideology um, becoming a kind of substitute for the mastery of facts, it's clearly gone too far. Facts in and of themselves, of course, are not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. But I think an excess of ideology is neither facts, knowledge, or wisdom. And in short, I think our country needs, to some extent, in our domestic policies, and I'm going to get to our foreign policies especially, we need to kind of return to policies that are based much more on the sort of our heritage of, of being very practical and being very pragmatic. So I think we need to endeavor to find policies that uh, really uh, whose, uh, whose purpose is to find, uh, find ways of solving problems and, and uh, allow us to achieve the goals that we need to achieve. And so as we look at the world, I'll start with a mention of about a year and a half ago, I was in Oman, Muscat, Oman. Probably most people haven't really uh, thought about Muscat, Oman until maybe just a few days ago when the, our two hikers who had hiked over the strait over the border from Iraq were and held by the uh, Iranians for some two years. They were returned to Muscat, which is just a short plane ride from Tehran. And uh, I met uh, there with the leader of that country, uh, Sultan uh, Qaboos. And I asked him what accounts for the sort of ideological fervor that we could see going on in the Arab world. And of course, what we were talking about was this uh, fundamentalism, this. Uh, uh, sort of extreme, uh, extreme religious ideology. And, um, you know, I said, after all, the Arabs are known for being a very practical people. When you look at, uh, you know, Arab business community, they're, they usually try to meet the customer in the middle with some kind of uh, bargain. So how did, all, how did all this happen? And the Sultan's answer to me as he sat there, he had a dagger, this beautiful uh, uh, jeweled dagger in his large belt in the middle and this uh, fantastic, you know, headgear, and I just sat there sort of looking like I do now with a suit and, uh, and a tie. And the sultan said to me, don't always look for political reasons for everything, because sometimes it has to do with a cycle of history. And uh, cycles, too, will change. And so I always thought about that, because basically he was saying, you know, don't you, know, don't you Americans, don't just think in terms of you've got a problem, have to find a solution. So you need to really step back from it and understand the flow, the ebb and flow, really, of, of history. So I believe, um, I believe that we have come to a point now, 10 years after 9-11, where I can feel that cycle of US history uh, beginning to shift. And I can see that our country today is probably not 
the same country it was uh, 10 years ago. But how it does, and how it manages its way through the next 10 years, I think will be extremely, extremely crucial. So I think it's important to see what, uh, what is, to describe what has happened, even if we can't entirely explain what had happened. And in the past 10 years, our country, I think, kind of lost some of our pragmatic roots and embraced a view of a mission in the world that was completely unsustainable and I hope will not be, be uh, repeated. The Iraq War, and it was a war that when I, you know, when I was in Poland, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> yeah. It's an 800 number, whatever. <laughs> The, uh, the Iraq War was um, very broadly supported in our country, and it was broadly supported for, uh, for a lot of uh, different reasons, and some of them good, and some of them turned out to be not so good. But I think, in a way, we, we ended up looking at the Iraq War as somehow a struggle between forces of dictatorship and democracy, and to be sure, that fault line was there. But in our desire to see it as a struggle between dictatorship and democracy, and of course we had one of the most brutal, hideous dictators the world has seen since World War II, that is Saddam Hussein, we fail to see, I think, another very important fault line in Iraq. And that fault line was really coming to bear or having an enormous effect on the country internally. And that was the struggle between the Shia and the Sunni political identity. And so talking about Shia and Sunni seems so old-fashioned, seems so last century. I mean, after all, we'd like to see it as, as a struggle between democracy and dictatorship, as we had seen in many other countries. But in fact, the Shia and Sunni identity, though that was the fault line that really drove the crisis in Iraq. And what we did, and what we didn't really understand we had done, is we took a minority-led country, a country that had been since the British marched in in March of 1917 and looked at the kind of havoc that they had uh, helped create as they brought all those Indian troops in up the uh, Euphrates Valley. And they looked at the, uh, the situation in, Iraq, in uh, Baghdad and they said, how are we gonna, ever going to run this place? And as the Brits often did in these colonial situations, they, they looked around and found, you know, who's the toughest tribe around here? Who are the people who really look like they know how to keep the others in tow? And that, were, that turned out to be the Sunnis. So the British, as the uh, Sunni Ottomans had done for centuries before, essentially left the country in charge of, uh, uh, run by the, the Sunnis. We came in, and with a view that Saddam was not necessarily a Sunni, but was rather just a dictatorship, we got rid of him, but lo and behold, in the process, we introduced majority rule in, um, in Iraq, and, and we had a Shia, Shia government there. Well, the problem was, it was certainly the right thing to do, but the problem was the rest of the Sunni Arab world saw that we had flipped a country from the Sunni world into the Shia world. We hardly seemed to know we had actually done that. And this was considered quite threatening to many other countries in, in the region. So for example, uh, the Saudis, knowing that, um, knowing sort of how we think, they, they said to us, look, uh, by making that country Shia, you have created a situation where the Iranians are going to have a free run of, of Iraq. You have created a security situation where the Iranians are going to take over, and in so doing, you have, re you have uh, worsened the situation or made the situation dangerous uh, for the rest of us. The, ar it, the argument made some sense. The only trouble is the Shia of Iraq are not the Shia of Iran. And the Shia of Iraq, if you start looking into the history, and um, uh, I mean, with due respect to other people who look at uh, political problems differently, I do believe that history matters. And when you start looking at where the Shia of Iraq came from, you will find that organically they were probably more related to Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia than they were to Iran. So the Saudis tell us a story about how we have endangered the country by bringing, by making it, uh, giving an opening to the Iranians. But really, 
what we had done was in, in putting Shia, uh, in allowing the Shia majority to take over in that country, we had created a, created a situation in the Saudi mind where other Shia communities, and there are Shia communities all over the, um, uh, the Arab world, that we have somehow given political expression in a way that it hadn't been done before to the Shia communities in, in the Arab world. And the Saudis in particular worried about a province called the East Province, where most of the Saudi oil is, is produced, were worried that what kind of signal, what possible signal this could have given to their, their own Shia, Shia minority. Similarly, the Saudis worried about Shia in uh, places like Kuwait. The Shia are not quite 50 percent, but they're, uh, they're very, uh, it's, it's a substantial community. There, the Saudis were very worried about what the Shia in Bahrain would do, and in fact, several years later, we could see what they would, what they would do because the Shia in Bahrain are, seven, are some 70 percent of the population. So we saw from the Arab, the Sunni Arab world, where with the possible exception of Syria, I say possible exception because the complexities of that place are you know, far more than just talking about Shia and Sunni, every single country in the Arab world was Sunni run, and here we had taken a major Arab country and flipped it and made it Shia. So it is truly an, ex, uh, uh, an example of the, uh, of the law of unintended consequences. Most people engaged in this didn't know about it, and if they did know about it, they didn't want to know about it. And so we entered, uh, so we stayed. We realized that the, uh, the one option that was not available to us was simply to walk away from the problem of, uh, of the, uh, uh, from the Sunni Shia problem. We have worked very hard to try to in ensure that Sunnis were part of the governing, governing structures with the understanding that, frankly, at the end of the day, it's going to be run by the uh, Shia community. It is, we have uh, brought in uh, hundreds of thousands, indeed tens of millions of dollars worth of technical assistance to ensure that Iraq has uh, the proper um, uh, institutions of governance. Where, where we help build their capacities, we help strengthen their institutions, we worked on independent judiciary, we worked on all kinds of things to the tune that if you stand back and look at the overall investment in Iraq, it, it reaches over $1 trillion. Whether we have been successful with what we've tried to do in kind of imparting to Iraqis the things they need to do is hard to say. I talked to an American colonel one day who had just come from a meeting in which the Iraqis were allocating bandwidth on their radio systems, and uh, the American colonel told me he sat there giving his advice, and finally an Iraqi official said, uh, Colonel, you need to understand one thing. We were allocating bandwidth before you came, and we will allocate bandwidth after you leave. This has nothing to do with how you're going to tell us uh, how to allocate bandwidth. So I think it was kind of a sober reminder to the U.S., not just in allocating bandwidth, but in doing everything else, that there are certain limits to how much, how, how effectively we can uh, uh, convince countries to behave better and indeed to be more like us. It is not to say that you cannot give advice, and uh, you can uh, advice, I think, it can be very well taken, but it is to say that if you try to stand back and wag your finger, shake your finger, or shake your fist at a country and tell them to be more like us, chances are they're going to be less like us. And so I think the lessons of this are, first of all, to know what you're doing when you enter the country. And secondly, uh, if you haven't learned every lesson, and you probably haven't, you have to start uh, uh, adjusting with the, with the thought in mind that you are really, at the end of the day, not going to stay there for the rest of time, and that they have to, uh, the people there have to make their own decisions. I found in time and time in my, in my life in, in diplomacy, there was the issue of how do you convince someone else to do something that that person doesn't want to do. 
And uh, I think uh, just like in one's uh, uh, personal life, uh, as well as in the life of a nation, you can't necessarily count on them to listen to you when you're shouting at them. You've got to somehow work as closely with them as you can to get them to trust you. And I think trust uh, does have a lot to do, uh, a, a big role to play in, in diplomacy. So I think it's been very important that when Americans are overseas that uh, they conduct themselves with a sense of modesty, with a sense of not just telling people what to do, but most importantly, with a sense of uh, sort of sharing an example, an American example that I think has, uh, has worked uh, very well. I think one of the reasons why uh, someone like Ambassador Weiser was successful in Slovakia is I think people realized he was sharing an example. He knew what he was talking about. He was not pushing them uh, on, uh, in, a, in a way to suggest that he was in any way scolding them. He was working with them and he had the same goals in mind. So I think we need to be very careful when we go into these countries and think that we can somehow remake them into our image or to try to make ideological arguments. Uh, I think we need to look for problems that they are having and problems that, uh, and ways that we can help them overcome their, their problems. I am pretty, at the end of the day, very, uh, I'm pretty optimistic about, uh, uh, about Iraq. Ironically, the one reason I'm optimistic is the reason that I know was not the reason that we entered the country, and that has to do with the oil sector. Uh, Iraq now has 11 major international oil co companies with contracts not to take Iraqi oil, but to have service contracts to help the Iraqi people develop their own oil. Iraq, when I was there, had slipped down to something like 1.7 million barrels a day. Today, Iraq is something on the order of 2.6 uh, million barrels a day, expected to go to some 3 million barrels a day. Within about two years, it should be eclipsing uh, uh, Iran in terms of uh, uh, barrels per day. That is, it should be over four, 4 million barrels a day. And probably in about 10 years, depending on international uh, conditions, Iraq will have some something on the order of 10 million uh, barrels a day, which is the output that uh, the Saudi, Saudi Arabia has. All of this is to say that um, and, oh, and by the way, the, the, of all these 11 major oil companies, only one was, was an American company. So this hardly passed the test of uh, invading Iraq for the purpose of taking their oil. And so I think the Iraqis will have the wherewithal to build, a, uh, build infrastructure, to provide services to their citizens, to improve the, uh, the uh, you know, hospital care, to uh, provide for electricity. One of the kind of shocking things uh, I discovered on my first day there is that no Iraqi is, no self-respecting Iraqi is ever going to pay for his own electricity. That is something the government pays for. You don't pay for it yourself. I looked at that and I said, well, gee, can't we just put meters on people's uh, apartments? And, you know, because the demand was skyrocketing while the supply was going up, but not exponentially. And I was told you can certainly put, um, uh, put meters on people's houses, but it'll take a battalion of troops to do that and a firefight to follow. So, so I think Iraq, uh, the Iraqi authorities understood that a whole heck of a lot better than I did and understood the point is that, that for, for certainly the time being, and I would put that in the next century or so, uh, the Iraqi government is going to, pro is going to uh, pay people's electricity bills, not the consumers of the electricity. Again, wrong policy move, but it's the policy move that they have thought about and they know what their people can sustain. So I think one has to live with some of these, uh, some of these issues. And I think what, what is impressive in, in the case of Iraq is I think they will have the wherewithal to, uh, to deal with uh, some of these things. They will pay for services. And alas, because they do it in many other parts of the world, they'll pay off insurgents. Again, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a beautiful picture. It falls short of what we would see as, uh, as democracy, but nonetheless, I think it has uh, it. The country at least has a future, and one of the reasons is that I think the security situation has continued to improve, notwithstanding what we read in the newspapers every day. We have a Kurdish uh, part of Iraq that is 
feeling a part of Iraq because when they see the potential of 10 million barrels a day and they know that they are entitled to some 17 percent of central revenue, central government revenue, they know that 17 percent of 10 million barrels is a lot more than 100 percent of 100,000 barrels. The Kurds have figured that out. So I think we'll, we'll be okay with the Kurds. I think the Sunnis uh, are, have been invited to have some key ministries with the understanding that the Sunnis in Iraq need to, uh, um, need, to, need to come to grips with the fact that the country is going to be run by the Shia. But as we move a little to Afghanistan, we also see a place that I think the U.S. Got, allowed our sort of uh, ideological side to get out of whack with our practical side because we came into a country that if you study the history and you don't even need to study it, you just need to look at a couple of pages of it, this is not going to be an easy country to turn into Switzerland. And yet that was, um, that was clearly the effort of the United States. And worse yet, worse yet in Afghanistan, we took a, um, a we looked at that situation and did what one really uh, should have, uh, we fell into a trap that, that is as, as old as man himself when we tried to fight the, the last war in Iraq. So uh, there was an effort in the last couple of years of the Obama administration to have a surge. Uh, and the concept of a surge, which of course had been used in Iraq, was to uh, flood U.S. troops in there so that we could seize territory, so that we could hold the territory, so we could build on the territory, and then finally transfer the territory back to the local authorities. Well, that works in a country that's 70% uh, urban, as Iraq is. And why is Iraq urban? It has to do with water resources, but it's 70% urban. All the people live in the cities. Afghanistan, it's some 70, even 80% rural. So if you try to increase the number of troops by some 20%, you are really not going to get at what the uh, military talk, talks about troop to task ratios. You would have to double, triple, quadruple the force in order to manage the rural environment of, um, of Afghanistan. The other uh, sort of uh, backseat uh, driving I would do in, in Afghanistan is I would be very careful about the notion that you can uh, bring in additional lethality, as we've done in Afghanistan in the last year, where we bring in additional capacity to kill bad guys and think that by killing more of them, you'll bring them to the table. Um, the way it works is not that someone gets killed and the rest of the family sits together and says, you know, the Americans really had a point about our cousin there. He was not a very nice guy. That's not how it works. The family sits down and they say, the Americans have killed our cousin. We didn't like our cousin, but they've killed our cousin and he's our cousin and therefore we need to pick up arms against the Americans for that. That is a basic cultural fact that proved to be an elusive concept with many of us because we looked at it, and not even in terms of the mirror imaging of, cult of, of cultures, because I don't know about you, but when someone comes after my family, I don't care what my cousin is like. I want to go after them, and lo and behold, the Afghans have been like that and in spades. So I think we've made a lot of mistakes there, and I think the one thing we've done that's right is to say we're getting out of there. It doesn't mean that uh, we have, quote, unquote, lost the war. It doesn't mean that somehow uh, the Taliban are necessarily coming back. And I think Karzai, for all the criticism of this guy, understands that he needs to figure out how to work uh, reconciliation with what are sometimes unreconcilable elements. So I think we have made a decision to try to make sure the uh, Afghans start to deal with these, these issues. Whether it turns out well, whether it turns out so-so, it's hard to say, but I think it is time for us to start getting out of the business of blowing up mud huts and back into the business of what the 21st century security agenda should really be for our country. I think we need to take a much more strategic view of the issues we face in the world. Um, 
I think the issue, the number one issue, in my view, is the issue of, of dealing with, uh, with nuclear, uh, with aspirations of countries like Iran, countries like North Koreans to develop their own nuclear capabilities. These two countries are very much engaged in this. It is um, because of the technology and the fact that the technology is becoming more and more uh, uh, known to different people, uh, to different countries, I think we have a very serious problem because if Iran is allowed to get away with this, you can be sure that uh, what they call in Sunni Arab world the Shia bomb will soon, there will soon have to be a Sunni bomb. And uh, while Pakistan has a Sunni bomb, it doesn't count in the case of Sunni Arab states. And so I think it is pretty inevitable that if the Iranians are allowed to get away with this, we can look for a Saudi effort uh, soon to come. Similarly, in East Asia, we, I think we have to stay on the situation of, of North Korea because if North Korea is, is able to develop, to take this nuclear device that they've been able to uh, get to explode underground and put it on one of their missiles that they have been testing, I think we will have a very serious problem in terms of proliferation. I used to say that Japan's, uh, the chance of Japan ever going nuclear was about zero. Now I'd put it north of zero. The chance of, I uh, used to think that the chance of South Korea ever developing nuclear weapons was at zero. I would not be comfortable with predicting that either for the rest of time. So I think we need to, we need to deal with the, with the North Korean uh, uh, danger. Um, one of the reasons I think the Bush administration did absolutely the right thing on North Korea in terms of, uh, of our, our policy, and this uh, comes very close to, to home here. In fact, if you want to hear a counter version of this, someone opposed to the Bush policies, uh, read the Dick Cheney book. But um, I feel it was very important when President Bush met with the Chinese President Jiang Zemin in, in, in Crawford, Texas and said to the Chinese, this is not an American problem. This is, a, this is a problem involving world leaders, and in particular, this is a problem involving the region. And I think the decision to get China directly involved, to get Russia involved, to get South Korea and Japan involved, as well as the United States, was absolutely the right decision. In addition, uh, if you go back to 2004, 2005, when this policy of trying to engage the North Koreans was, uh, was first started by President Bush, we had a situation where, the, uh, where many people in, in Asia, many people uh, in, um, in the world, really, were blaming the North Korean nuclear issue somehow on American intransigence. Well, if you have turned North Koreans into sympathetic characters out there, you are clearly doing something wrong, and we were doing something wrong. When you looked at polling data in South Korea, there was some over oh, some 50 percent of South Koreans were blaming the U.S. for the crisis as well as the North Koreans. So I think the president's decision to get the U.S. involved in a negotiation was very important. We did make some progress. We worked with the Chinese, which I think was uh, an important thing to do. But we we got the North Koreans to. Uh, to um, disable, to, to shut down and then disable their plutonium plant. We have known about their efforts in uh, uranium enrichment, but first things first, we had a plutonium plant that was actually producing fissile material, whereas the, um, the issue of uh, uranium enrichment is still a future issue, albeit a great threat. But most importantly, we established some patterns of relationships. We show that we can work with China. We showed to the South Korean people that we were not opposed to negotiation, and that we would teach, treat the South Koreans not as a sort of little brother, but rather as a partner in, the, uh, in, in, in this very important endeavor. And so soon we saw that that polling data that I described a couple of minutes ago shifted as it should shift, that is to, a, to South Korean public putting the blame where the blame belonged, and that is on North Korea. So was the, the mechanism was right, the approach was right. What has not yet succeeded is getting the North Koreans to cease and desist on, on this nuclear program. I think the key missing ingredient here has been China. And I think we need to, as a, 
with respect to the North Korean nuclear issue, with respect to some of the other international issues that we have, whether it's human rights in Sudan or, um, or violating sanctions in Iran and things like that, we need to have a much more comprehensive and successful relationship with China. I think one of the problems we have had with, uh, with China is that the United States has looked, we have so often looked at the Chinese in too much of a transactional mode. That is, we will send uh, senior officials out to China maybe once every six months. We will try to um, uh, have a uh, you know, discussion with the Chinese aimed at some deal, and then after three days, lo and behold, we have some deal, which frankly doesn't really amount to something to, to that much. I think we have to shift from a transactional-based policy with the Chinese to a much more relationship-based policy. And I think the, um, it, the United States needs to make China a much better, um, or a much, put China in a much, uh, um, in a position of being where we understand that this is probably the key relationship that we have to face in, in the world today. You know, if you look at the American public and how they regard the Chinese, uh, there are some people who look at China as somehow, uh, you know, the Soviet Union again. It is not the Soviet Union. Um, there are some people who look at China as somehow just a benign place where you go to this sort of giant uh, Disneyland. It's not that either. China is a challenge to us, but it is also an opportunity, and it is a, uh, a country where I think we, together, if we can work with China, and we need to do this by deep-seated relationships. I think we can do uh, we can do more. Um, I think the um, uh, I would like to see in any uh, new administration, whether it's the Obama second term or the uh, 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 Michelle Bachman first term, I think there needs to be. That was a joke. I didn't mean to, I, I, but. Uh, there needs to be much more effort early on to establish patterns of relationships with the Chinese so that we can work together. We should not be going to China when we need their help on something. We should not be going to China when somehow you know, we're worried that they won't buy our T-bills. They will buy our T-bills. That's not why we should be going there. We need to be going there to get them to know us better and for us to know them better. And in so doing, we need to be able to create this, uh, these relationships. China is not a perfect partner by any means. China has some of the most belligerent people in the world living there. China has, like many big countries, including our own, they are beset and consumed by many of their internal problems. But uh, this does not mean that we shouldn't be trying to engage with them as a partner. I think um, a few years ago it was talked about how China needs to be a stakeholder in the current international system, and I think that's a pretty good way to describe it. I think we need to somehow develop this. I think we need to get out of this kind of love-hate relationship with the Chinese, try to take some of these oscillations out of our policy with the Chinese and try to work with them on a more business-like uh, uh, framework where they know us better and we know them better. And I think if we can really focus on that relationship with China, a lot of good things can flow. I think we will have a much better chance of dealing with North Korea than we do now. You know, people often say the reason the Chinese have not been helpful on North Korea is they're worried that North Korea would implode and that somehow you would get 20 million North Koreans moving into China. I submit to you that's about the last of the issues the Chinese are really worried about. I think they're much more concerned about the fact that if you have the last Marxist-Leninist country in the world um, uh, implode, what would that do? How could that affect China's internal developments? How could that affect the sort of lineup of forces within China, some of whom uh, you know, look to the past for inspirations, other in China, others in China look much more to the future? I can assure you the Shanghai business community has no interest in maintaining a close relationship with North Korea. They would throw them under the bus in a Shanghai minute. Um, yet, if you go up to Beijing and if you talk to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, to the International uh, Department of the Chinese Communist Party, you see a lot more enthusiasm sort of make, maintaining that relationship. If you go to the Chinese Foreign Ministry, 
Uh, again, no interest in maintaining a relationship with North Korea. They find it an embarrassment. But if you go to, um, to uh, the Chinese people, uh, the People's Liberation Army, you see a much more, much more interest in maintaining those, uh, those relationships. It's especially true in Northeast China, where warlords are gone, but warlordism is not necessarily gone. You see relationships between Chinese military and North Korean military. It's very complex. And we need to understand the complexity of China's historic and cultural uh, relationships with North Korea. We also need to understand that there is a lot of old think in China, and there are people who, when they look at the possibility of a North Korean demise, would say, aha, this means we lose, the Americans win. So we see in, in the Chinese a kind of uh, zero-sum view of this uh, of North Korea. And I can assure you there are many Chinese who think win-win is the name of a Burmese dissident rather than a good policy to follow. And so I think for, you know, just on North Korean terms, we need to work much more with China. We need to avoid the kind of issues we've had in Southeast Asia and the, in the uh, um, in the South China Sea, where it is not in our interest to turn to Southeast Asian countries and expect them to choose between us and the Chinese. They don't need a pep talk about the problems of China. They don't need to be told that China uh, could be a threat to them. We don't need to tell them that. What we do need to do is stay present there, is stay engaged, uh, have our uh, be engaged uh, economically, be engaged uh, in terms of uh, security. When you look at the, the way our fleet, 7th uh, uh, Fleet based in Hawaii, has been uh, present throughout uh, Southeast Asia, when you look at the fact that every natural disaster, it's U.S. Uh, 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 Marines and sailors who tend to get there before even a, a, uh, the, uh, the countries, uh, the country where the disaster took place, even before their troops could get there, you can see that we have generated a lot of goodwill in that part of the country, in that part of the world, and I think we ought to. Uh, continue to do that. So I think when the Chinese understand that we're not going to leave, we're not going to be, uh, 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 we're not going to put ourselves in the position of, uh, or put those countries in the position of choosing between us and the Chinese, I think uh, uh, some of this kind of nasty talk that you hear from within China, which sometimes like the our own nasty talk, uh, is as the purpose of it is internal rather than external. So I think we really need to um, need to sort of step up across the board uh, uh, with the with the Chinese as we good, go forward. I think um, turning to other parts of the world, we need to be very very careful to preserve the, the North Atlantic uh, uh, relationships and the and the uh, the importance of, of NATO, the importance of the U.S. and the uh, EU uh, relationship. You know, there are many reasons, perhaps, why we shouldn't have been involved in Libya, but the one reason where I think we, which overrode all those other reasons, was the fact that we needed to stick up for our European allies with respect to Libya. What Sarkozy was thinking is something between Sarkozy and, uh, I guess, his wife. Uh, what David Cameron was thinking at times is, is, is hard to understand, but what we were thinking I think was correct, which was to not open up new gaps, with, to not open up uh, new um, uh, tensions with the, uh, with the European leadership. And so I think we did very well to stick in that one until, until it ended. And I can, uh, I can assure you, based on my experience in Kosovo, it wasn't easy because you had a sort of classic, what I think uh, political scientists would call a, a um, sort of strategy policy mismatch. You had a policy of trying to get rid of the guy. You had a strategy of protecting civilians. And it wasn't at all clear how that strategy of protecting civilians was going to support the, um, the policy of getting rid of the guy, except insofar as it simply ignored the UN Security Council resolution that set out the kind of narrow, uh, narrowness of the, uh, of the uh, overall um, of the UN Security Council the resolution, which was very narrow compared to what uh, everyone's policy was. So I think we, uh, we persevered with it. 
And uh, I think we, um, we should uh, be very careful about doing it again, but I think when our European partners are engaged, we need to be able to show that we are a good partner. And I think despite all the derision, the complaints, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the attitude to the President's uh, view on that, I think the President was absolutely right. We should be in a supportive mode and not necessarily in a leadership mode there. I think the President really got that right. Finally, I think the United States stands for more than just uh, pragmatism or practicality. We stand for more than just uh, open markets. We stand for democracy. We stand for you know people who are in the streets, who are, are trying to get their voices uh, heard and trying to live, if not a better life for themselves and for their, uh, if, if not for themselves and for their children. And I think the United States does need to be on the right side of history. And there comes, uh, that's when we get to, I think, probably the most interesting um, issue of our time, which is the Arab Spring, or as I like to call it, the Arab thing. Um, <laughs> to be sure, it is not the first thing in history like that. Uh, if you, um, uh, there have been other such uh, contagions. But I guess what bothers me a little about our reaction is first we sort of look at our kind of uh, international uh, sort of recognized, uh, you know, icons of modernity, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or texting, and we conclude, ah, oh, this is some sort of uh, of technological uh, revolution that uh, because Egyptians were able to somehow communicate with each other through, uh, through Facebook, they're somehow more like us than we think and therefore we should support them since we all like uh, Facebook. First of all, um, I know there's some people in this room who don't need to be reminded of what happened in 1989. Uh, in Eastern Europe, which was the last time there was one of these extraordinary social, uh, uh, economic, political movements, uh, uh, that is, in, uh, where you know, the yoke of communism, which I never thought in even as, as late as 1986 would ever be gotten rid of in my lifetime. And it all went away, despite the fact that no one had Facebook. In fact, um, if you go back to uh, um, 1848, uh, which was called the European Spring, uh, somehow movements in different countries were connected, and, uh, and they did that not only without Facebook or without the internet, they didn't even have electricity. So my first point would be to be a little beware of these kind of this sort of echo chamber of these uh, international symbols that we all like because it makes us sort of feel more comfortable when we hear about Egyptians and, uh, and social media, because we understand social media. I think when you start sort of putting aside those issues that make you feel more comfortable, you will start saying that actually the movements in the Arab world were far more heterogeneous uh, than maybe our headline writers uh, suggested they were. In some cases, and I would put Egypt in this case, there was no doubt a legitimate effort to over, uh, overcome an authoritarian regime that clearly had outla outlasted its shelf life. I think clearly uh, what was going on in Egypt had to do with sort of uh, civil society uh, rising up and saying we're not going to take this sort of semi-military regime anymore. Um, but when you start looking at Yemen, when you start looking even at Libya, you can start seeing that the situation is far more complex. And while um, New York Times uh, uh, editorial writers may want to stand in the middle of a square in, in, in Egypt and talk about this, uh, this new day, I think it behooves us to have a little more of an analytical framework of what's going on so that we can predict what's going to go on tomorrow and what we need to do to help, uh, to help ensure that what does go on is in our country's interest, that is, is in the interests of a, of a more peaceful world and in interests of, of, of uh, betterment of people's lives. So I think the Arab Spring is clearly, as we move into the autumn, is continues to be a, uh, a work in, in progress, but I think it's something that we need to be very close to the action, we need to understand it, and we need to be able to support it where we can. And that gets to the final point, which is 
we are going to need to uh, support diplomacy abroad in a way that we have supported military intervention abroad. Now, it is true, it is true that NASCAR is never going to hold a Support Our Diplomats Day. And so uh, we need to understand that uh, American diplomats are not going to get the, quite the cachet that uh, American troops have had. Uh, you know, if you think of our country as a giant high school, uh, diplomats are not the football team. That would be someone else. So we do need to convince our country, to convince our people that diplomacy is not somehow a, the art of telling people things that are not quite true. Uh, diplomacy is the art of getting people to do things that maybe they wouldn't have done if they hadn't had a conversation with you that diplomacy is the art of getting people to think about their interests, articulate those interests, be supportive. And, you know, there are three ways probably, if you uh, stand back, there are three ways to convince other countries to do things uh, uh, that they wouldn't otherwise uh, do. And one way is just the strength of argument. And sometimes, I suppose, someone will hit the side of his head with the palm of his hand and say, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. That is truly brilliant. Thank you for that piece of advice. We will change our policies immediately. So that's one model. The second model is to say, uh, is to basically give people an offer they cannot refuse. And uh, we've done that, and, uh, and uh, that is where I think our military interventions have, have come. And I think we need to be very, very judicious in doing that kind of uh, uh, approach in the future. And the third way it's usually done is to say, work with us on this. And if you do, we can promise you a better relationship. We can promise you that we will be able to help uh, work on things together. We can give you some assistance. We can help you with your ministries. We can help you with your roads. We can help you with various things. And that's basically the way uh, diplomacy uh, happens. And what I worry about is if we're not going to have the budget to do that, if, we're, if, if our Congress is not going to be prepared to give the money to do that, well, I think we're going to be kind of out of business because we are going to have a situation where our secretary will go to a country and say, work with us on this or that, et cetera. And I think we could well face the situation where no one listens. They uh, usher him or, or her outside, out the door and bring in the Chinese ambassador. So I think we do need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to fund these things. We need to be prepared to uh, support diplomacy, not just as an element of force. I mean, force should be an element of diplomacy, or the threat of force should be the element of, a dipl of diplomacy, not the other way around. And so I think we, come, we are coming to a very difficult, uh, uh, difficult time where I think resources are going to be stretched in our country. It is not sustainable uh, for me to suggest that we need to build more uh, schools in, in Afghanistan. Well, we don't have the schools getting built in Pueblo County in Colorado. There's a point at which the people living in Pueblo County are simply not going to support schools in Afghanistan if they don't have schools of their own. So I think we have to be much more mindful of some of these economic issues that we have, uh, we have faced. I am a, uh, not just an eternal optimist, but I'm certainly an optimist of our about our country. I do believe that at the end of the day, we are going to learn how to reason together. We are all going to learn how to sort of calm down and try to resolve these issues because I think we can see that uh, if we don't resolve these issues, if we don't develop more consensus, if we don't develop a greater respect for the uh, opinions of others, I think we are going to be in, in a lot of trouble. You know, it is hard to blame, uh, uh, you know, as to how this kind of polarization in our country took place. I think it, um, you know, my candidate for blame is the internet, or I should say internet shopping. Because um, when you buy a book on the internet, the uh, whoever sold you the book, let's say you buy some crazy political book, they'll say, if you like that crazy political book, here are four more crazy political books uh, you ought to read. So I really think we could start with internet uh, shopping where if you want to read that crazy political book, let me give you four examples of different kinds of political books that would make you a lot smarter. And so 
If we can't get uh, Amazon.com to change their algorithms, we ought to be changing our al algorithms and start having a much greater respect for people who come at issues from a different side. So thank you very much, and happy to go to questions. We have a microphone set up over here for those people who would like to ask questions. If you would just line up in front of the microphone, Ambassador Hill will take your questions. Okay. The rhetoric of U.S. foreign policy has been to support self-determination for people throughout the world. And I wonder what your take is on the stance of the U.S with respect to a two-state solution in the Middle East? I think um, whether uh, our policy is effective in this regard, I, my own view is it's the right policy because I think you know, our last three presidents have supported a two-state solution, essentially, but they've also supported the fact that if the Palestinians are going to have a successful state. They need to work things out with their neighbors, namely Israel. And I think the, uh, the effort of uh, sort of, of encouraging the Palestinians to do just that, even though the tasks are very difficult, uh, there's been a, you know, a lot of history there. But I, I, think the, I think the U.S. has a correct uh, approach not to be supporting unilateral declarations there. Um, you know, uh, I, I hate to quote Slobodan Milosevic for inspiration here, but uh, um, he once said, he once made the point, I remember I said something like, I know you think we have a double standard. He said, no, 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 you don't have a double standard, you have multiple standards. And uh, indeed, I think we do have, uh, have different standards. I think the the result of, um, of Kosovo was to go on a sort of unilateral basis or a basis of Kosovo declaring independence with some support, but without regard to the Serb position. And I think that was obviously problematic, but at the same time, I'm not sure what could have been done. So I think these are often just tough decisions. It seems that uh, what we're doing, or what the U.S. policy is doing, is putting um, Israel in the position of having a veto over Palestine yeah, yeah. achieving a, a state. And yeah. if you look historically at the situation, the Israelis did not negotiate with the Palestinians yeah. to establish the Israeli state. Yeah. yeah. I, again, I, I understand the point that we don't want a situation where Israel is essentially given a veto over the establishment of a uh, neighboring state. I understand that point. but. I think the reality is that what we're asking the Palestinians to do is to stay in a comprehensive negotiation with the Israelis with the result of the you know, various iterations of such a negotiation with the result that you could get uh, that win-win solution that we've talked about. I think there are things the Israelis have uh, the uh, expectations of achieving through, some, through such a process. And I think, uh, finally, it is, uh, it is a Pyrrhic victory, indeed, if, uh, if a, a Palestinian state is created which is a mortal enemy of its neighbor. So uh, I think there's a good argument to I insist on some sort of negotiation process with the understanding that um, um, veto is too much of a static way to look at it. I think it has to be seen in the sort of dynamism of a negotiation. Uh, could you just um, discuss what uh, you feel the United States' role is in the United Nations, particularly the Security Council, both reflecting back uh, on when the Iraq War started and also moving forward? I think the, um, the U.S., uh, I mean, I, I think we have uh, sought to give a much greater, much greater scope to the Security Council than, than sometimes we've done in the past. I think the decision that uh, Colin Powell rather insisted on, which was to have a UN Security Council resolution, 
uh, with respect to Iraq was the right approach. I think uh, the, the Obama administration has tried mightily to make the UN Security Council uh, uh, very much of a relevant uh, factor in, in uh, important issues of our day. Uh, Ban Ki Moon, uh, I think, is a uh, is has been the right uh, Secretary General uh, for his times. I think he has really uh, he understands that he represents 192 different countries uh, and uh, has has uh, maintained good relations with us as well as the uh, uh, as well as those other 191. Um, I think the issue is we cannot look at the UN Security Council the way some other countries do because we have global responsibilities. And so I don't think we should put ourselves in the position of being sort of, I think we need a little creative ambiguity about our view of some of the Security Council uh, uh, decisions. I don't think we can simply uh, uh, be a uh, sort of policy taker the way some countries are. I think we need to be in on the uh, implementation of these things and to avoid a situation where we are choosing between national policies and Security Council policies. And I think if we can kind of square that circle or av avoid those types of uh, uh, zero-sum situations, I think we'll be okay. And I think that's what administrations have tried to do. And uh, even though uh, many American people have great reservations about the UN, others have been very supportive. And I think our administrations have tried to, uh, tried to manage this. And I think it was very important to pay our dues. I mean, it's important to pay the dues if you're the chess club uh, member. And it's important to pay dues if you're in the UN Security Council. And uh, I think I'm, I'm pleased that even through these difficult budget uh, times, uh, everyone has understood that that is not an issue that should be uh, raised again. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I do thank you for joining us this afternoon. The um, lecture was wonderful. Um, I have a question. So it's about the Middle East in yeah. terms of security. Uh, the Middle East is a volatile region. I don't think I have to convince you or anyone in this room about that. Um, so I think it would be in everyone's best interest if there was a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, but there seems to be a sort of, <coughs> sorry, there seems to be a chief roadblock, principal roadblock to that, and that's Israel's substantial nuclear arsenal. Um, we don't know the exact magnitude of it because uh, most of those weapons are undeclared to the best yeah. of my knowledge. Um, so I guess my question is, why is Israel allowed to have a substantial nuclear arsenal but a country like Iran isn't allowed to think about one, which is what's yeah. currently going on. Yeah. And um, why hasn't there been more pressure from the United States to address Israel's um, <clears throat> nuclear arsenal, which seems to be the world's uh, worst, best, worst kept secret? Yeah, I mean, mind you, Israel has never tested. Um, and uh, they've kept the kind of strateg strategic ambiguity They've also made assurances about no first use. I mean, I understand your point, but I'm, you know, um, I think, you know, the difference between a lawyer and a diplomat, a lawyer often sort of looks back and, you know, how this happened, you know, and a diplomat sort of looks forward, what can we do about this? Um, I'm not sure uh, ratcheting up some kind of public pressure on Israel over an issue, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't disagree with your description of the issue. Uh, I'm not sure going forward with a kind of U.S. Uh, you know pressure on Israel in this case is really going to get us too far. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's really um, anything that we would have a consensus on within this country, within the United States, to pursue. And I think to some extent, you know, your foreign policy does need to have the backing of the American people. I'm not sure we'd have it for that kind of uh, approach. And um, I mean, more fundamentally, I'm just not sure it would really contribute to uh, what, we're, what we're seeking in the, um, in the Middle East. Um, if you look at um, President Obama's Cairo speech, I mean, this was really an effort to try to get us on a uh, better footing with the Arab world. 
And uh, of course, there are issues that are, you know, like the one you've described, that are not going to be easy to uh, to take on, and maybe, uh, as I've suggested, are uh, not possible to take on. But I think there's so much in that speech to build the relationship that we all want with the Arab world that I would like the Arab world maybe to focus on those uh, elements of the possible rather than the one element that I'm not sure is possible in the current world that we live in. So I take your point, but uh, I think we need to go forward with policies that are, are ones that can lead to uh, better, a better situation. And so I, I, that is not the first one I'd take up. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador. Um, with regards to the six-party talks, uh, do you believe that it's actually in China's interest to uh, change the status quo in uh, North Korea, or that they're actually in a better position, at least in the short term, um, having them there, making them sort of a focus of uh, U.S. foreign policy? I, um, I, I, think, I think it's in China's interest to resolve this issue. Uh, I think if this issue is left unresolved, as I suggested, it, it, would, it could have proliferation issues, whether Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, you know, these are all technologically advanced countries. So I think it's in China's interest. But I think to, to understand China's situation now is to understand how China's decision making uh, works. And ironically, whenever, when, when they would have meetings of the uh, or at least of the five heads of state of the six party talks, you did get the impression that the weakest, the weakest head of state was, uh, was Hu Jintao. That is his ability to get other elements of the Chinese government around him on an issue was weaker than President Bush's or President Obama's. So I think um, it's, I, I think China's problem has to do with its internal decision making. And uh, as I described earlier, there's a lot of old think there. Uh, and uh, I think the remediation to this, for this, is to have much more discussions with the Chinese about what we would all do if uh, North Korea were to go um, belly up. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that North Korea is going to leave the scene uh, in the next few years. I just don't know. But uh, it's certainly within the realm of possible. And I think uh, a, a more comprehensive discussion with the Chinese, even if the discussion is 99% uh, uh, us talking and 99% uh, and them listening, I think would be a useful thing. I think we need to overcome some of the, the trust factors in China. You know, would they be concerned that we'd put listening posts up on the Yalu River? Would there be concern that we would uh, increase the uh, number of U.S. troops in the Korean Peninsula, have Koreans, uh, U.S. troops north of 38th parallel? Um, I, I think we should maybe describe what we would do. I mean, in my opinion, uh, we would end up with fewer uh, U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula than we have now. And I think kind of having extensive talks with the Chinese in this regard would be useful. For example, we've done uh, uh, so-called concept of operation planning. Uh, you know, what if in North Korea, you know, there's some breakdown of civil authority? How would we handle the nukes? How would we handle the, uh, the um, humanitarian situation? I would say share it with the Chinese. Just just put it out on the table and show them what we're talking about. And you know, uh, it won't go well for the first session. The second session probably won't go well in the twentieth session. But you know, anyone who's even you know has ever sold soap on TV knows that you know people don't listen to your soap ads for the first nineteen or hundred nineteen times. So I think we need to be a little patient with it and understand that sooner or later the Chinese would get a better window into our thinking than they have now. of the negotiations with North Korea to lessen the nuclear situation there. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, can, is this um, given the example of North yeah. Korea in using successful negotiations yeah. to lessen the nuclear crisis there, um, and Ahmadinejad's domestic challenges, as well as his recently expressed desire to revisit the situation um, in an interview with Nick Kristof, you mentioned how Iran would be interested in closing its enrichment facilities if the West would sell them already enriched 
materials. Yeah. Um, do you feel like enough has changed for the U.S. to go to the negotiating table with Iran? Is is this is it time to take advantage of this opportunity? We are. Um, you know, we, we negotiate with Iran through this uh, so-called quartet process with the UN, with the uh, European Union, the Europeans, and um, we, we have one of our best diplomats dealing with it, uh, Bill Burns, who's our Deputy Secretary of State, I mean, just a fabulous person on this. Um, you know, so I, I, I find it difficult to be critical of what we're doing. I think we have the right people. I think we've got the right people at the table, uh, right, you know, mixture at the table. Um, I don't take everything that Ahmadinejad says at face value. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I think we have to be, we have to understand that he will say things publicly which he knows are not true. And, uh, you know, I, I think our leaders try to avoid putting themselves in that position. I'm not sure he tries quite as hard. Uh, so um, I think what is worrisome is, you know, we collect a lot of information through uh, different channels, so-called national technical means. And I think uh, often the information we collect is very different from what he is saying. So. Um, I think it's important to explore those things, but uh, I think you have to kind of be mindful that if you explore those things too publicly, somehow the pressure can be released. Remember, a lot of countries don't want to do sanctions. So let's say, you know, uh, the, the Iranians say something and we sort of publicly say, well, we find that very useful and et cetera. That would be a signal to people who are, who are trying to enforce the sanctions, but who have a lot of resistance in, our, in their own country to say, okay, we don't need to do this. Looks like they've uh, resolved this issue. So you gotta be very careful about kind of responding publicly. My assumption is that, uh, you know, based on the people I know working on this, that if uh, there was truly something interesting or something possible that Ahmadinejad is suggesting, I'll bet we're on it. Um, but you gotta be very careful of overreacting, especially in public. What would be your prediction on the status of relationship between uh, China and Taiwan, and um, what should the U.S. stance be in this matter? It's a tough audience here. <laughs> um, I think in the fullness of time, uh, Taiwan and China will achieve a modus operandi where the issue of Taiwan sovereignty simply doesn't emerge uh, the way it does today. I think uh, one of the reasons that has not happened to date is the fact that uh, domestically in China, in this sort of constant tug of war between various elements in China, uh, I, I think their, China's own domestic policies would uh, really not allow some kind of, uh, of uh, solution short of a complete uh, uh, amalgamation of Taiwan into, uh, into China. So um, I don't think the Taiwans believe that they need to do something like that, that is to uh, sort of you know, take down the flag and join China. So I think for now, there's not a big change. But I, I think what is really holding up the potential of change lies in China's own domestic political stalemate where China really, they know, and you know, we see statements about, there are hints about this from people like Wen Jiabao. We know the Chinese realize they have a political security system that is not uh, the right system for the uh, for the rest of the country for the sort of social and uh, and uh, economic system and that this sort of these internal struggles go on and so I think until China gets its act together internally, I don't see a real uh, solution on the uh, on the Taiwan issue and finally when they do get their act done um, together internally, I suspect it'll be something where 
no one uses the word sovereignty, but um, you know Taiwan is allowed to go upon its merry way uh, uh, as a, um, a thing out there, uh, and that uh, there will be uh, it will not pose the kind of problem it has posed uh, uh, to date. One more, yeah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead. I'm not going to go up there. This is, a, this is a tough one. I'm afraid I have to be tough, too, because uh, as a diplomat, you took some shots at one of the four teams that's undefeated in the National Football League. <laughs> and you also ignored a team that has a better record than, than Boston, the Detroit Tigers. So. <laughs> they got yeah. <laughs> I'm very pleased that the Tigers have finally started having winning records. Um, you know, it's that's a good thing. We all support that. I, you know, I think the field though is much too big. But as long as you have pitchers like Verlander, I guess you'll go with those 600-foot fences there. <laughs> so, yeah. Does this gentleman just want to ask one? I, I did, actually. Go ahead. Um, certainly, my generation has grown up uh, with an America that believes it sort of has the responsibility and right uh, to intervene across the world, a right that's been largely yeah. unchallenged, being how, how we're the only superpower. But in a world when, in which China and India are catching up to us economically as they industrialize their much larger population bases, do you see America's view of itself as a country that has the the sort of right and responsibility to be the final arbiter or even the uh, leader of, of world intervention changing for America as both China and India well, try to take on some of that role? I like to think that it is changing. That is, uh, I mean, I think we have seen a time where we have sort of the uh, neoconservatives and the liberal interventionists, both of whom, uh, both extremes basically taking the view that we have a right to intervene and that the U.S. military is... Uh, is supposed to do that. I like to think that we are in a new era where uh, deploying our U.S. military all over the place or trying to solve problems militarily uh, is uh, probably less of an option than it's been before. But you mentioned, I think, a very important point, which is I would not like to see China and India to feel that somehow they have some kind of right to intervene with anybody. And so uh, the fact that the Chinese regularly, you know, vote against us in the UN or whatever, is saying uh, it should be, uh, you should allow countries to, uh, that's their internal affairs. We have taken the view that basically there are no internal affairs now. These are uh, issues having to do with uh, countries' uh, status as member states of the UN. They have to live up to certain standards. And, you know, I, I understand that point. I don't think it's... Uh, you know, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's sovereign right to, you know, eat children for breakfast or, you know, do the sort of things he was doing. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm not sure I would want to hear the Chinese and the Indians talking about a right to intervene for whatever reason. I just don't think, uh, you know, we have our problems managing this issue of the use of force, and we have, uh, we've had a lot more time to work on it than the Chinese and the Indians have. So I would be very worried if I saw from them the... Uh, uh, what you're suggesting, which is a right to intervene. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.